Good day, everyone. In this lecture, we'll be considering semiconductor and PN junction. For that, the uh, crystalline structure of solids, we know that the commonly used semiconductors are partially covalently or partially ionically bonded crystals of diamond or zinc blend structure. We already know that uh, the covalent bond consists of the mutual sharing of one or more pairs of electrons between two atoms, while the ionic bonding is a type of chemical bonding that involves the electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions or between two atoms with sharply different electronegativities. And if we consider the uh, elements in group four, of uh, the periodic table, that is uh, carbon, which has about six electrons in the uh, outermost shell. Let's say, uh, no, six electrons rather, but four electrons in the outermost shell because it has uh, four valence electrons. That is 2p2. Two carbon, then we have 2s of 2, okay? These are the four electrons in the outermost shell, the four valence electrons. Then we also have silicon, which has 14 electrons, and we have 3p2 and 3s2. Then we have the germanium, which has 32 electrons and four electrons in the atom shell, 4p2, 4s2. Then we have the team. Uh, then which has 50 electrons. Then it has four valence electrons, so 5p2, 5. So this is electronic configuration. And then uh, we have lead, which has 82 electrons. So this is 6, 2, 6, and 2. So all of these are elements in column four of the periodic table. And we'll observe that each atom starts out exactly uh, with four valence electrons occupying, in this case, two uh, P and two X spin degenerate atomic orbital states. And each bond has two spin states and can accommodate two electrons each, okay? Two electrons each. In the ground state of the solid, each of the group four atoms contribute one electron to fill the two available spin states of each diatomic bond. For instance, we have the silicon, for instance, it has one, two, three, four. So it contributes just one electron to fill the two available spin states of each diatomic uh, bond, such that if we have another silicon here, then this contributes another one, and then this forms. A complete bond. So this has four, for instance, and we can go on and on. Here is another silicon atom, and say so we have a silicon atom here. So we have a silicon atom here, from the complete bonding. So we have a silicon atom here. So we have a silicon. Atom here, and this is 
silicon atom here. So each silicon atom contributes one of the two spin states. Okay. And now all the available bonding states are filled exactly by the available valence electrons from each state. In this crystalline solid, every electron is indistinguishable from every other, and every site is also indistinguishable from every other equivalent site. And it should be noted that the electron states and host states are not localized on any particular bond, but are linear contributions of the bonding and anti-bonding states of all the bonds that are the eigenstates of the whole crystal. Now, for instance, now that we have the four, four, yeah, semiconductor form, because this is a group four, uh, uh, me a metal, uh, a solid rather, solid, uh, a group four solid, these are silicon, silicon atoms. So here we have the bonding state in four, four semiconductor form. Now it should be noted that the valence band is completely filled in the ground state. While the conduction band, which is formed by the antibonding state, is completely empty. in the ground state. And when an electron is excited, say, from the valence, let's say this is the valence band here, valence band, let's say this is the valence band, and this is the conduction band. So here we have the band gap, okay? So when an electron is excited, say from here, into the valence, from the valence band into the conduction band, for instance, it will occupy one of the conduction band states of the whole crystal, meaning in the conduction band, just like in the valence band, we have quite a number of conduction band states. Okay, so it could, you know, uh, take on the state. And then, if further excited, it could move on to another conduction band state. So let's say this conduction band state one, conduction, so let's say this conduction band state one, state two, and this is state three, is state four, state five, and so on. So since there are many more conduction band states, the excited electron can move from one state to another state, to another state, and this leads to a net electric current flow in solids, hence its name, conduction band. So when the gap between the valence band and the uh, conduction band is much greater, that is this band gap, if it is much greater than the thermal energy of the electron, then there are few electrons in the conduction band. And such a solid is called the insulator. And when the band gap is relatively small, say, Uh, so the band gap is relatively small. Then this is the conduction band. Yeah, this is the valence band. Let's say on the order of one electron volt, then the device is called a semiconductor. 
And when there is no limit between the conduction, the valence band and the conduction band, okay, there is no exact uh, limit or there is no gap, then we say this solid is a metal. Mm -hmm. And in order to evaluate how the electrons and holes uh, and holes energies vary with the linear momentum of particle in solid, we need to identify the variation of the energy in the wave vector K space of the de Broglie waves corresponding to the particles in the periodic lattice. And in the nearly free model, the crystal is represented by a quantum well of macroscopic dimension. So let us put that in here. Good. Now, if we uh, represent the crystal by the quantum well shown in red, okay, for a nearly free model, now the column potentials between the atomic states are reduced from that of the individual atoms due to the opposing fields of the ion cores of the atoms in the solid. And we know that the electric uh, potential due to the charge following from Coulomb's law is the same as V, in the same as one over four pi, epsilon naught, Q over R, where epsilon naught is the permittivity in vacuum, permittivity in vacuum, okay? And there's a related distance and then there's the charge, okay? So, this reduction of the column potential between the ions can actually cause the atomic orbitals to mix with those of their neighbors. And this will lead to the broadening in energy and the spatial extent of the electron uh, charge distribution. And in metals, this can free the valence electrons from the atoms and allow them to roam freely in the whole solid. While in semiconductors, each electrons may be freed from the valence band at the operating temperature by the solid and excited into the conduction band. This can drastically alter the characteristics of the solid. And this schematic here, where we have the well, you may want to revise the lecture on quantum wells, okay? We're having a dimension D for which uh, in order to establish symmetry, uh, we have to divide at the uh, central level uh, such that we have to deal with some sine and cosine wave function inside the well for ease of analysis. And then uh, we see uh, that this uh, is a linear array of ion cores because uh, where the dots, the dots we have here, which are equidistant, okay, at some distance A, are the ion cores, okay? And the corresponding periodic crystal potential happen to be these cores, okay? All of these cores that we have, okay? They are the periodic crystal potential. And then we have the quantum well at the dimension of distance d. So if we have a one-dimensional linear periodic array of atoms, for instance, with the electron potential energy due to the ion cores, due to these ion cores, okay, inside the crystal, say it is given as V of x being the same as V naught, for x less than minus d2 and then v cr the crystal for x for x less than is for minus d over 2 less than x less than plus d over 2 and then V naught again 
for x greater than positive d over 2. So at this side of it, at this side of it, we have v naught, okay? That's v naught, okay? V naught here. So right in here, we have the VCR, V sub CR, it's for the crystal within this dimension. Now, the crystal potential, VCR, has the translation asymmetry property such that x plus a is the same as VCR, where a is the periodicity of the lattice, okay? Uh, because that's the point at which it repeats, okay? Between this point and this point. So then it repeats again. So A is the periodicity of the crystal, of the crystal lattice. In our, in our case, we are dealing with a semiconductor device. Following through from here, the corresponding time-dependent Schrodinger equation for the dimension minus d over two less than x less than plus d over two is given as the Hamiltonian operator. We're operating on the wave function, which is the same as h naught part. The crystal potential and this is the same as minus h cross the two m d squared the x is VCR of x sine effects, which is the same as the energy times the wave function. Now, since the crystal is invariant under the translation, x plus a to x, okay? Okay, on this translation, except near the edges, the charge distribution in the crystal must have the same translational invariance property. That is between all of these. Okay. And then if X have the translational property so that S tends to X plus A, then the probability density function of X plus A is the same as the probability density function of X. That's for all X values. So hence, the wave function itself can differ from a purely periodic function but most a phase factor and must be of the form psi e of k of x being equivalent to two e of k of x sorry j k x where u e of k x plus a is the same as u of e of k of x. This is periodic with periodicity a. And the free particle wave function epsilon j k x of the overall wave function wave function of the overall wave function psi e of k of x is also called 
the envelope function. And know that E will now depend on the value of K, okay? So that E will now depend on K. So due to the periodic condition, we therefore have that K of E, K of X, may be expanded as a Fourier series, such that n is equal to zero, plus or minus one, plus or minus two, all the way. C is of n, of k, epsilon j, g, sub n, x. This case, g sub n is the same as n dot two pi, over a. Hence, the blocks theorem, that is the blocks theorem, blocks theorem, therefore states that solutions to the Schrodinger equation in a periodic potential takes the form of a plane wave. Potential takes the form of a plane wave. by periodic function. So, these solutions, therefore, are this, this, and then this. Now, you will recall that an electron with a fixed linear momentum, say P sub X, in free space, is a de Broglie wave, having the wave number K being the same as P sub X over the reduced Planck's uh, constant, which is the same as the square root of 2M times the energy, which cross. And this is, and this has a constant amplitude, okay? With a constant amplitude. So from Bloch's theorem, the de Broglie wave of an electron in a periodic potential wave region is a spatially amplitude modulated wave with a periodicity equal to the lattice spacing, like we saw, the lattice spacing in the well, okay? No way, huh? And hence, the crystal has the momentum, crystal momentum, H, H cross K. Now the angle functions and the corresponding angle values will now depend on the wave number, such that the Schrodinger equation will now become H cross squared of 2M, d squared, dx squared, plus the crystal voltage or potential, rather. Sorry. E, so k, fx will now be the same. Call that energy is not dependent on the big number. K, sorry, k of x. Here we have that wave function, solution to the wave function is the same as u k 
k x epsilon j to x which is the same for n taking on values plus or minus one plus or minus two all the way to cn k epsilon j k plus g n x now the allowed values of the wave number k are determined by the boundary conditions on the overall wave function okay and since we're interested in the intrinsic property of the material we consider a large uniform session of the crystal say negative d over two to positive d d over two okay and now if we take this length for instance to be l then we can as well replace our d with l say negative l over two to zero this will be positive l two okay so this spans uh, over a large number of lattices or lattice sites yeah so lattice sites in the well okay in an let's say infinitely large crystal that is if uh, if, for instance, we assume that L is some distance less than D, then we can replace this again. So say, let's say this is D now. If we assume again that this is D for this condition, L, then minus D over 2, D over 2, then L must be some parameters. Think this. That is, if D extends to some infinite value, then the finite range would be some negative uh, L over 2 less than some X parameters, then less than some positive values L over 2, okay? Such that we have parameters within a finite bound. And since we have a large uniform crystal, then by Bonn and Bonn karma, cyclic boundary condition, we have south E of K minus L2 be the same as south E. So k plus l2, call the boundary conditions, right? And then uh, in, this, in, the, in the case where the length of the well extends to some infinite value, then we have to take a limit within a finite bound in the well. Uh, know that l can be chosen to be an exact integral multiple of the lattice spacing, because this is the lattice spacing here. Just a right, so that u of k x equal to l two will be the same as u of k plus l two, and then recall that the envelope function eula j uh, kx of the corresponding amplitude modulated the Broglie wave at x being the same as negative l over 2 must be the same as in uh, when x is the same as positive l over 2 such that the eula minus j l over 2 must be the same as the eula j l2 and such that epsilon j k l equal one right and if j k l is equal to one then we see that the parameters of k must be some high 
n or l values where n is the same as one, two, all the way. Like we saw in the quantum well, okay? Now, if this is what it is, for a general three-dimensional periodic lattice, the crystal potential has a translational invariance property. Translational invariance property. Crystal potential, vector R, the same as a crystal potential, to so R prime, R, where the R vector is the same as N, okay? N to D. Then N3, C. Now, here, R is the vector connecting any two lattice points. So here, R is the vector connecting any two lattice points. A vector R in the crystal. And in this case, N1, N2, and N3 are all integers such that the vector A, vector B, and vector C are the primitive translational vectors. Okay, these are the primitive translational vectors or a set of three independent shortest vectors connecting two lattice points, and uh, they define the three-dimensional lattice. Since the crystal potential is periodic in X with a period or a primitive translation A, then the crystal potential X plus A would be the same as a crystal potential x. So as a periodic function in x, it can be put in the spatial Fourier series like we did earlier, VCR of x will be the same, sigma, n equal to plus or minus one, plus or minus two, all the way, d sub n, epsilon j, g so n x and in this case g so n for the two part n for a for n for all values of n in the same as plus or minus one so minus two all the way and v n here v sub n is a spatial Fourier coefficient spatial coefficients. And if the potential in the crystal is zero everywhere, so let's assume V sub CR is zero everywhere, that's V CR, then the normalized solution of the Schrodinger equation would be of the form psi e, okay, Zero of x with the same square of one over L, which is the finite distance between the crystal lattice. Let's make sure check x. And here, uh, E of k is the same as so h cross squared k squared two. And by introducing the periodic potential as a perturbation, then the corresponding eigenfunction and eigenvalues of the Schrodinger equation will now uh, become right, h cross squared, so m, the squared, the x squared, plus 
Soria. Efficiency. J K plus X. For N, we put it plus minus one, plus minus two, all the way. K of X, the same as the energy. Now, the equation may be solved by the perturbation technique. And if this here is very small, okay, say it's a small perturbation, okay, it's a small perturbation. like we covered in the uh, electromagnetic atomic uh, uh, interaction, right? Electromagnetic field uh, interaction with the atoms. Then the solution would be, the solution to the Schrodinger equation would be of the form of K first, the part of one. So J K X K K Then according to Bloch's theorem, then according to Bloch's theorem. This expression will be of the form okay. Okay. And using the procedure of the time independent perturbation theory for non degenerate states, the first order perturbed solution based on the Rayleigh Schrodinger perturbation procedure will now be of the form graph E sub M for now, then ket E sub L. One with the same as the bra E sub M sub M not which one not then cat E sub L of not either sub L of not minus E sub M of not. And in the limit where L now tends to infinity is given as C E of K, K be the same as we sub N. What? K minus K not K prime delta K prime. Okay, and this would be for E of not if K is not if K is not the same as E of not of K prime. Or better still, mod of K is not the same as the mod of K. And then the wave function of the first order we now be given as psi of E of K of X will be the same here. So J K X plus psi of one 
So k x goes all the way, which would be the same as one with L. So j k x plus sigma for n or the plus or minus one plus or minus two of the way, then v sub n of not of k minus v of not of k plus g sub n square root of one of f the euro j k plus g sub n x now since there is no first order correction to the perturbed energy angle values for the crystal potential of the form shown previously, then the lowest order of correction will be the second order, such that E of K will be the same as A A so K is all the way. There we will have h cross squared k squared 2m plus sigma n equal to 1, 2 all the way, and the mod bm squared k is not k, k is g sub n. So and this now leads to two important conclusions about the single electron states in the periodic table. Now, in the periodic lattice, recall that this is the power of psi e of x. X solution so it's one it's two three okay So, okay. now this is energy, and this is the wave function. Okay. Now, in the periodic lattice, you will see from the expression for the wave function that the angle state corresponding to each energy value is of k is a block state, which is the sum of the de Broglie waves of the wave vectors of the order k plus 2. And also, from the expression for the energy and this wave function, there are degeneracies in E of k at k points where E not K is the same as E not K plus G sub N for all values of N being the same as plus minus one, plus minus two, or so when these two parameters are the same, then this reduces to zero. Then this also reduces to zero. And this divided by zero, so this expression of this expression reduces to zero. And then you will see that there is or there are degeneracies in the energy value. The regions where these energies cross tells us where the band gap between the energy bands occurs. And in thermal equilibrium, the electrons in the solid will feel their valuable single electron states of successively higher energy according to the principles of thermostatistics, which is based on energy of the electrons. And then the density of states 
gives the number of available states per differential energy interval per unit volume of the solid as a function of either the energy or momentum of the single electron states in the solid, like we covered in, in our previous lecture on densities of states. And so, like we solved in our previous lecture also, including the spin degeneracy of two, the total number of states per unit physical length in the range of case space is given as two k over pi. Now for free particles in solid, or free particles in solid, we have that the energy is the same as h cross squared, k squared, to n, that's the mass. So that one dimensional density of state, including the two-fold spin degeneracy, is given us, so we mean one dimensional density of states, will now be given us e, so one e, the same as d, d two k pi be the same as one of pi cross square root of two m and generalizing to two dimensions so if so two dimensions density of states as a ds density of states then we have E sub two E E C mod the squared two pi which is the same as M over cross squared which happens to be independent of energy. Observe that two dimensional density states is independent. Of the energy. Now we can see the energy component in the one dimensional, but it's absent in the case. Okay. Now, this is a consequence of the fact that for free particles, the energy E, as well as the number of states per unit area in the two dimensional case space, are both proportional to k squared. Okay, because here we can see as proportional to our k squared. Hence, the number of states per unit area per energy interval is constant. And for the three dimensional case, dimensional case, that e three. E, Q, H, 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 squared, which is the same, square Q, 2 in Q, square root 2 Q, right R, S squared, which cross Q, in this expression is applicable to metals. Unlike in free space, now if we plot the E versus K, that is the energy versus the wave number curve in the periodic lattice, uh, you see it varies. Hence, the density of states as a function of E has to be modified in solids. And then the Fermi energy is the highest energy level occupied by the valence electrons in a solid at zero Kelvin. Okay. Fermi G.
and we usually designate this as E sub F. By using the one-dimensional free particle model, the Fermi energy may be determined from the number of valence electrons. So we now have number of valence electrons and E per unit length of the solid. And it is given by an E sub E equal to integral zero to any level or energy the one-dimensional density of states, the E, which will be 2, the 2 ME electron mass divided by pi H cross, square root of Fermi energy. And also, you can recall that the Fermi energy here is the same, so it's plus square root of by two times the number of valence electrons or squared, where m sub e is the electron mass. And the corresponding Fermi energy in terms of the number of electrons per volume for a three dimensional solid will be given as the 3D Fermi energy level, will be the same as h cross squared. So twice the electron mass, three pi squared, such that the Fermi energy is known from the number of the density of the atoms in the solid and the number of the valence electrons per atom. Okay. Hence, the knowledge of the Fermi energy helps with the knowledge of the valence electron density and vice versa. So you will recall that at zero Kelvin temperature, all electrons in solids occupy the lowest possible energy state subject to the Pauli exclusion principle. And recall that the Pauli exclusion principle states that in an atom or molecule, no two electrons can have the same four electronic quantum numbers, okay? So it states that in an atom, molecule, no two electrons same so, in other words, as an orbital can contain a maximum of only two electrons, the two electrons must have opposite spin. So, so two electrons in an orbital must have. Using spin. Okay? So, okay? And hence, if an electron is assigned a spin, say positive half, then the other must be assigned negative. Okay? That's the only exclusion. And then at a finite temperature, some electrons may be excited to states above the Fermi energy, okay? And the probability that a given energy state is occupied by fermions, that is a particle that has that, that, that has half odd integer spin, say half, three of two, and so on, follows the Fermi Dirac distribution function. That is, so we, so one over, Epsilon mu, which is the chemical potential, either by thermal energy, Boseman constant times the temperature, plus one. So here we have 
case of B is the Boltzmann constant, Boltzmann constant, and it is given as uh, 1.38 times 10 of 16 L Kelvin, or 1.38 times 10 to 23 joules Kelvin. Now, KBT is the thermal energy, okay? While mu, in this case, is the chemical potential. At some point uh, in this lecture, we are going to see where uh, the point, the chemical potential, is equivalent to the Fermi energy, okay? And by definition, the chemical potential is the value of the energy E at which the probability of occupation is the same as one half. That is, so here, mu is a value of the energy at which the probability of occupation is. Okay, and then uh, if uh, this is the probability distribution of electrons, probability distribution of electrons, then the probability distribution of holes left behind after some electrons have been excited to the conduction band is given as F sub H T below the Fermi level and uh, it is given as one minus the probability distribution of electrons T is one two so around P and the Fermi potential by the thermal energy this once again same as one. So long C by the C. So now at some temperature T much greater than zero Kelvin, the Fermi direct distribution functions for the holes and electrons are approximately symmetric with respect to the chemical potential. And the chemical potential is to mass flow as the electrical potential is to electrical form. And then we now see from the probability distribution of electrons that electron concentration at a given electron energy level above the chemical potential is higher where the chemical potential is higher. So <clears throat> electrons will diffuse partially from regions of higher chemical potential to regions. Of lower chemical potential. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and at T equal to zero Kelvin, the Fermi direct distribution function is discontinuous and the chemical potential is equal to the Fermi energy level, okay, such that mu is equal to the Fermi energy level. And at a finite temperature, say T, much less than some infinite value, so T is reasonably large, the chemical potential is determined from the condition that the total number of valence electrons, N sub E, remains the same as the temperature changes, with the bottom of the valence band chosen as the energy value equal to zero. So that the total valence electrons will now be given as and E, same as zero, and G, city of states, E, zero to infinity, city of states, T, distribution, electrons, E, is now to 
infinity set of state so e minus okay, potential thermal energy is one and since the since the chemical potential and the thermal energy for most temperature ranges of practical interest are equivalent, that is that equal, then the Fermi direct distribution may be written as since the chemical potential in most practical cases is the same as the Fermi energy level, then we have the distribution of the distribution of the electrons to so be equivalent to the main order. So E, so E sub F, either thermal energy is one. This is for electrons, electrons. Then a horse is equivalent to the main this is for holes. And the Fermi level is used for the characterization of the spatial variation of carrier concentration in the PM junction. Okay? And when the temperature T, for instance, is infinitesimally above zero Kelvin, that is, one infinity less than zero Kelvin, okay? or greater than zero Kelvin, so it's infinitesimally greater than zero Kelvin, then we can now have the total number of valence electrons to be given as an E in the same as zero E, G, and density of state, so here, state, either so energy, so e plus you see, energy, so See, so, okay. and we call at T for the zero Kelvin. The valence band is completely filled. Valence band is completely filled. And the conduction band is completely empty. Okay. And then the chemical potential mu is somewhere between the valence band and the conduction band, where it cannot be easily determined. So that if we have conduction band somewhere here and the valence band somewhere here. So it is believed that the chemical potential is somewhere in between both, but it cannot be easily determined, right? It cannot be easily determined. So that total number of electrons can now be written as zero. zero Density of state the same zero city of states. See, 
subsea, phenotype, yeah. good, so, so, yeah. and all substitute these values, parameters, then we have substituting the uh, probability distribution for holes and elections into this expression, then see, 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 now you see the piece is the number of holes in the valence band. Number of holes in the band. This is the number of electrons in the production. So long the width of the valence band is much larger than the thermal energy, as uh, the Boltzmann constant of steam, then the lower limit of the left-hand side as this side here may be taken to some value of minus infinity. Okay? Such that the choice of E equal to zero may be arbitrary, okay? So we can therefore rewrite this as infinity e t the same c c t c of state c In this case, we can now designate properly since we have this as a number of holes. Then we want to specify the density of state here as the density of state of the holes and the density of states of the electrons here. So, now designate this properly or more correctly as the density of state of holes is the density of state of electrons. Okay, why this is a probability distribution of holes, then this is a probability distribution of holes. And the total number in here, you now see that the total number of holes in the valence band Must be the same as the total number, the number of electrons in the conduction band. And this condition or effect is referred to as charge neutrality. And this implies that an electron excited into the conduction band leaves a hole in the valence band, thereby making the semiconductor device remain electrically neutral. So, so once an electron moves from here into the conduction band, technically, okay, let's put it this way. So, uh, so once an electron moves from the this conduction band, this valence band, from the valence band to the conduction band, it's a hole. And here it is filled. Okay. And when the electron is still here, then there's a hole here. So thereby enforcing 
charge neutral. So this system or the device remains electrically neutral. Electrical. And the chemical potential in semiconductor can therefore be determined based on the charge neutrality condition. And it is just above or below the band gaps. Okay, so we know that the uh, uh, chemical potential must be somewhere below the conduction band and somewhere above the valence band. Okay, but we know it's actually somewhere in between, it's below the conduction band, above the valence band. So at T, being some values positive. Okay, well, Kelvin. Then we have that the same as E sub C plus E sub B divided by two. Now, at T, at T greater than zero Kelvin, the chemical potential for semiconductors will change with respect to T and depend on the band structure of the conduction and valence band. So when, let's say, energy potential is, let's say, it's far, far greater than three times the thermal energy, then the Fermi direct distribution may be approximated by the classical Boltzmann distribution function, such that we have uh, the probability distribution of the electrons to be approximately equal to epsilon minus E minus the Fermi energy added by thermal energy and the probability distribution of holes approximately so G minus E. This is for induction band electrons. Electrons. This is for valence holes. And semiconductors under these conditions are regarded as being non degenerate okay? But it is necessary to use the more exact Fermi distribution when the semiconductor is under the degenerate condition. And density of states of electrons, and let's say, well, now, uh, okay, let us talk about the density of electrons actually, okay? Say, and C, okay, in the density of electrons, okay? At any special point in the semiconductor when the Fermi energy level and the density of state is known, and therefore be given as N sub C, C infinity, density of state for electrons, and C G, distribution, electrons. And also the density of holes PV, which is density of holes, will now be the same as negative infinity energy of and density of state of the probability distribution of force and when the energy minus the Fermi level, Fermi energy is far far greater than the thermal energy, the electron concentration will now be written as Sub C, but sub C to T, still state, level, 
Okay. Yeah, that's me. That's me. So, sub C. And if I energy, sub C, PT, so sub C, 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 is equivalent so C, which is the effective density of states. So C, yeah, so C, C is the same effective density states. Why in sub C is a density of Hence, this expression reveals that electrons in the conduction band may be viewed to be saturated at the bottom. Okay? At the bottom. So, value in sub C, or the lower limit of integration of the conduction band, where the equivalent density of states is now the effective density of states of the electron, okay? And in a similar vein, the whole concentration, so P, is the same as negative infinity, B, B, FH, B, same, same. This one is the effective density of state of force. So, so long. Once again, so E is the effective density state force. Okay? So E is the density of force. And once again, this expression reveals that holes in the villain's band may be viewed to be concentrated at the top, that's the upper limit of the uh, integration of the villain's band. So where the equivalent density, once again, is the effective uh, density of states. So hence, the product of the electron concentration in the conduction band and the whole concentration in the villain's band is independent of the position of the Fermi level and depends only on the energy band gap that is order c b to give us n c and b so b sub g okay so this is independent of the fermi level but it's dependent on the energy band gap okay? sub g c and gap So, in this, or better still, in this case, or in the case of um, the uh, intrinsic semiconductors, that is, conductors without impurity atoms in them, then the electron hole densities are the same, okay? Such that NC is the same as the PV, right? So B is the same as the intrinsic density, okay? So that I squared now 
C, so V, which is the same as N, C, P, V, so earlier, Japan card, so. Now, this is for intrinsic semicolon. That is a semi indotto without impurity atoms. Impurity. So when we have some impurity atoms included in the uh, semiconductor device, such that the crystal lattice is modified to either accept an electron or better still have an additional electron to give up, then we say the semiconductor device is an extrinsic, extrinsic semiconductor. Then, so why? Same, Now recall that uh, the extrinsic semiconductor is just a doped intrinsic semiconductor. Okay? So when the intrinsic semiconductor is doped with some pretty atoms, that's what. And now, note that this expression reveals that the product of the electrons in the conduction band and the holes in the valence band is constant and is independent of the sources of the charges or the location of the Fermi level. Hence, by increasing the concentration of one type of carriers by doping with impurity atoms, the other oppositely charged carrier concentration will be seen to decrease proportionately. Okay? And when the electron concentration or the electron density is the same as the whole density, then we come back to what we referred to referred earlier to as charge neutrality. And the Fermi level in, in, in intrinsic semiconductor may be given as negative infinity, okay? of state the distribution goes the same state of infinity state of state the distribution of electrons and then when mod e minus Fermi level is far greater thermal energy, then we have that the uh, Fermi energy level is the same as the energy of the conduction band plus the energy of the valence band divided by two. So half is the thermal energy, natural logarithm of the effective density is the ratio density. Hence, the Fermi level is dependent on the effective densities of states of the poles and the electrons. And one more thing before we go into the PN junction so analogy uh, relative to the wave number Recall that the energy depends on the wave number, K, okay? Uh, and models a parabola such that sub C, K, same as squared, twice the effective mass, squared, okay? So the effective electron mass is a measure of the curvature. Should we plot E? Let's just okay? But, uh, let's just okay. 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 Such that effective mass is the same squared squared sub c k squared. K 
here, you already know that no, sorry, star is the effective mass. Electron. Since the spatially localized electron is a wave packet, uh, the group velocity of the corresponding wave packet given us velocity u k, which is one h cross c. For the equation of motion of the localized electron. Near the bottom of the conduction band, subject to the force F, will be given as the time rate of change of the momentum, P T, right? Where P is the momentum of the particle. So P is momentum of the particle. And B, so G is the group velocity. So, for a wave packet to be seen as a particle, the momentum P may be described as a product of an effective mass and the group velocity, such that F G divided by T, or that momentum is mass times velocity. So since we have the velocity and we have effective mass, so this gives us the momentum of the has to be where the mass, effective mass is a constant, then we have that is plus squared C K squared K C. And now, uh, for these two expressions, that's uh, F here, this expression here, and this expression to be constant, such that this is the same as H cross the K T, right? So um, for this expression, that's this. And this to be consistent, then we must have that a squared e sub c a squared c power squared or better still and say that the effective mass is the same as h squared squared sub c portion one squared and if this is the effective mass of the electron then we can also establish that the effective mass of the whole will now be the same which was squared squared sub k squared minus And here you will note that the energy of the hole E sub V at a given K value is the same as the negative of the corresponding energy E sub C of the missing electron from the valence band at the same K value. So that is E sub V of K is the same as negative E sub C of K. Because here, uh, this is. EC, this is EV. So once the once the electron leaves this place, it leaves a hole, then we have an electron here. So it means that they are proportional. So once we have the electron back here, then, then we have a hole. So hence, E sub V of K, depending on the location, say K, K is the same as negative this. And then the effective density of states of the electrons expressed in terms of the effective mass at the bottom, at this place, at the bottom, 
of the conduction band and at the top of the valence band can be, in a, can be given as uh, so C I over square root of two square root C squared squared two so square two square square two. So where these are the effective density of states, effective density of state of electrons, effective density of state of the poles. Okay. With respect to the effective mass at the top of the valence band here, and uh, with respect to the effective mass at the bottom of the induction band. And the position of the Fermi level related to the effective mass or masses of the electrons and holes will now be the same as uh, S of C plus S of B, energy levels of the different bands, conduction band and valence band plus 3kc4, natural logarithm of mass, effective mass of the ball, divided by the effective mass electron. Okay. And since the effective mass of the electron here, at the bottom of the conduction band and the effective mass of the hole at the top of the valence band are the same, then the Fermi level, Fermi energy, must be at the middle of the energy gap separating the conduction band and the valence band. So let's say if we have something like this. So if this is the middle, so this is the then the energy level, which is at the middle of the energy gap, this is at the middle. Energy gap. Okay. And then, since this model is a parabola, it's also it's a parabola. So it means that this from this distance to this distance and this distance to this distance I could distance. So if for instance we have a hole here, then we will have an electron here. And if we have a hole here, for instance, we will have an electron here. If we have an electron here, then we go. Okay. Where this is the energy band of the conduction uh, band, energy band. Okay. So this is a plot of E, so E, it's okay. And this is so because the number of electrons the same as the number of holes, okay? Number of electrons is equal to the number of holes. And should there be any variation, then this Fermi energy level will have to shift, okay? Have to shift from the middle, okay? So now if the effective mass of the electrons is less than the effective mass of the holes, then the Fermi level is above the middle. Here, Fermi level is above the middle. Okay. So it means that what we have here, effective mass of electron is less than the effective mass of holes. So it means that 
we have more concentration of electrons in the valence band than in the conduction band. So let's assume we now have some more electrons here. Now have some more. So once the concentration, then the energy level shift up. Don't forget charge neutrality, okay? But come to that later. So the effective mass of the electron at the bottom of the conduction band is less than the effective mass of holes at the top of the valence band. So, and if it's vice versa, then this will have shift down. Beautiful. So now, we want to talk about the uh, n-type and p-type extrinsic semiconductor. So let us talk about the extrinsic, extrinsic semiconductor. So here we have p-type and p-type, right? Type. So now we are going to be considering the group three, four, and five, uh, the, the, the uh, uh, column three, four, and five of the periodic table. Okay. So good. And here we have the column three elements having three valence band, three valence electrons in the atomous shell, and the column four elements having four valence electrons in their atomous shell, while the column five elements having uh, five valence electrons in their atomous shell. So for the uh, column three, we have the boron, uh, aluminum, gallium, indium, and thallium. While for group four, we have carbon, silicon, uh, germanium, we have tin, we have lead. And for the column five, of group five, we have the nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, then we have the antimony and the bismuth, okay? And now here we have a slight configuration for uh, uh, a regular uh, lattice structure where we have uh, either a 4-4 combination, let's assume this is silicon here and the silicon here and it forms a silicon crystal. And there we see that all of the four, uh, valence electrons uh, are covalently bonded by uh, with other silicon atoms. But should we replace one of the silicon atoms with a uh, group three element, probably gallium, okay, or here, then we now realize that in this case, we have three valence electrons paired up with the uh, four valence electrons from the group four, and then we have a hole left here waiting to be paired. Okay? And as such, this has the capacity to accept an electron. Okay? Okay? And then you say, for this, it is a p-type material, p-type extrinsic material, because the uh, uh, group three element here is seen as an impurity atom. Okay? So in this case, this is the impurity atom, which changes the lattice structure so that it leaves a hole that can accept an electron, okay? And in this case, where we have to replace one of the group four elements uh, by uh, a group five element, say uh, we have um, arsenic, something there about, you know, with, the, uh, with this, with any of the group four uh, structure, and then you realize that all of the four of the five valence electrons are covalently bonded with the four valence electrons of the group four element. And here we have one free electron, okay? Waiting to be donated, okay? And this is seen as a donor and hence it is an entire because it has a free electron, okay, to be donated, right? So, to the conduction. So this is entire. 
extrinsic material. So this group five atom is seen as the impurity atom. Okay. So in other words, the group three and the group five impurity atoms will either be acceptors, waiting to accept an electron, for which we can take the P for the P time, okay? Because the hole is positively charged, right? Or either donors, okay? And so the end time, because the electron is negatively charged, right? So this can donate an electron, so it's a donor, and it's an end time, and this can accept an electron, so it's an acceptor, so it's a beta. So for the five four, you see for the five four semiconductor device, four of the five valence electrons will be loosely bound to the positively charged impurity uh, V ion as uh, a hydrogenic atom with a relatively small ionization energy compared to the band gap of the semiconductor. And the potential due to the positively charged nucleus of this impurity ion in the host lattice experienced by this loosely attached electron, that is this loosely attached electron, in the hydrogenic model of this dopant is approximately a Coulomb potential in a dielectric medium and is given as uh, B sub i bar is approximately the electronic charge squared. Oh yeah, epsilon here. Yeah? is the dielectric constant of the host crystal, okay? Now, the corresponding energy level of the hydrogenic ion and then of the form E sub n, electron charge to the power four times the electron, effective electron mass twice the dielectric constant squared, reduced Planck constant, and and squared. Here, the dielectric constant is approximately 10 for a typical semiconductor. And n here is the quantum number, or principal quantum number, since we have more than ever four, ml. So, this n is a principal Now note that the impurity atom can be easily ionized and made to donate its fifth electron, which is this fifth valence electron, to the conduction band of the street semiconductor. Now, once that is done, it leaves a positive ion, okay? In place of the silicon atom at one of the atomic sites in the diamond lattice. So the crystal will then have more mobile negatively charged electrons in the conduction band to conduct electricity than the intrinsic atom, okay? Now this type of semiconductor material, like I said earlier, is the entire extrinsic semiconductor. And for the uh, group three, four, we have the p-type extrinsic semiconductor. And note that doped semiconductors are still electrically neutral. That is, for the n-type semiconductor, but once uh, this electron is donated, it leaves a hole here. So in other words, the total number of electrons we have in the valence band uh, the total number of holes in the valence band must be equivalent to the total number of electrons in the conduction band, okay? So hence, uh, the total number of negative charges in the conduction band must be equal to the total number of uh, holes in the valence band was this partially uh, fixed ionized donor we have from the purity, right? And then we now have that the electron concentration density is the same as the whole density plus the 
uh, concentration of the dough, right? And then by implication, increasing the concentration, the donor concentration implies a decrease in the whole concentration, okay? And the corresponding Fermi level must move upward. So this is what we have. So we have C, this is C, then this is intact because uh, as the donor concentration increases the whole whole concentration concentration decreases this and then the Fermi level Fermi level moves up. And for the p-type, this is the so C. This is the So this is for the p-type material. So. Uh, the p type material here c is plus so this case pv so c is minus so the semiconductor for the p type semiconductor uh interceptor concentration na then the charge neutrality condition is this Charge. So once, uh, in this case, once we uh, increase the acceptor concentration, as acceptor concentration increases, then the electron concentration decreases, right? Electron concentration decreases. So the Fermi level, in this case, Fermi level will move downward, right? So we have and at low temperature, when the thermal energy is small compared to the band gap, but comparable to the ionization energy of the donor, then the conduction band electrons are expected to be mostly from donors. And therefore, for the n-type semiconductor, the Fermi level at low temperature will be close to the middle between the donor level and the bottom of the conduction band. So we have something like this in this case. And, uh, see. And at low temperature. And then at te as as the temperature increases in the N type semiconductor, more and more of the uh, conduction band electrons would come from the valence band, okay? So it means that electrons will begin to draw from the valence band to the conduction band as the temperature increases. And the Fermi level of the extrinsic material will move downward and approach that of the intrinsic semiconductor. And then we are going to have something like this.
So we have something like this. And then for the P-type semiconductor, at low temperature, the Fermi level will be close to the middle between the acceptor level and uh, the top of the valence band. So that they have something that looks like this. This is P-type. This is, this is a valence band. So this is the Fermi level. Level of the P type material. So, as the temperature increases, the Fermi level of the extrinsic material will approach the Fermi level of the intrinsic semiconductor such that this level, that is, we now have, so that this level will now be. Now be equivalent to as the temperature. So know that when the semiconductor material is heavily doped, the number of impurity atoms may significantly alter the band structure of the uh, resulting extrinsic material. Now the PN junction model, scope of the PN junction model. So we have uh, a model for uh, the PN junction. And due to the difference in the Fermi level, you see the Fermi level for the P-type material is down here. And for the, uh, the Fermi level for the N-type material is up here. So due to the difference in the Fermi level between the P-type and the N-type material when they are brought together to form a junction, uh, so uh, the chemical potential of the P-type and the N-type dope, dope semiconductor of the same kind. Here, we observe that the charge carriers are seen to flow from one side to the other, leaving partially filled ionized acceptors and donors behind. Now, this effect results in a built-in electrical potential difference across the junction, across this junction. And when the two sides form a perfect junction, like we have here, this is the junction here, based on the concentration gradients of the conduction band electrons and the valence band holes, charge carriers will move across this junction, okay? Charge carriers will move. And the conduction band electrons will diffuse across the junction from the N side to the P side to be trapped by the acceptors here on the P side and leave positively charged ions here, that positively charged ions, okay? Uh, uh, and so the valence band holes will also diffuse across the junction, okay? To the P side, uh, from the P side to the N side, to be captured by the donors on the N side, and then they will leave negatively charged ionized acceptors on the P side. And know that the resulting charge or space charge field due to the partially fixed ionized donors, which are these uh, on the N side and the ionized acceptors on the P side will raise the electrical or electron energy on the P side relative to the N side until the chemical potential on both sides are equal. Now, under that condition, the probability of occupation of the states of the same energy relative to the common potential on the two sides become equal and no charge will flow across the junction anymore. Now, consequently, the electron energy corresponding to the bottom of the conduction band on the P side, on the P side, is higher than on the N side, okay? And the difference is the built-in electron potential 
given us the electron the, 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 elect the electronic uh, the electron volts uh, the electronic charge times the uh, potential or, elect uh, or electrical potential and then that will be giving us EVB in the same as ACP and as ACM, okay? Where this is the electrical potential and has a positive value. And then the E sub C is the electron energy at the bottom of the conduction bond. And in this case, you will note that the PN junction has an asymmetric uh, voltage current characteristic so that if we plot this graph, that's I versus V. So we experience something like this for the forward bias. So the electric current flows through the junction from the P side to the N side in uh, such that uh, when we have the PN junction, PN, and then the P side is positive with respect to the N side, which is negative, okay? So this is positive with respect to the side, which is negative, okay? And so it is seen that electric current flows through the junction from the P side to the N side. Uh, here it's very much larger. When the applied voltage on the P side here is positive with respect to this side. And this condition is referred to as the forward bias. And that's what we experience on the side of the characteristic, okay? And in the and in this region, uh, which is uh, reverse current, say the P side, N side, and now the P side is negative with respect to the N side. So this is negative, this is positive. So the reverse current from the N side to the P side, when the P side is negative, Stamina is negative. Uh, relative to the end side, it's much smaller. So this condition is referred to as a reverse bias. And then characteristic goes something like this, where we have the breakdown voltage here. In the, in the absence of no applied voltage, the electron concentration on the end side, that is the major carrier of the junction, is within the Boltzmann approximation. And then we have N sub N. It's approximately the effective density, epsilon minus, like we showed earlier, epsilon minus F, IQ. And the electron concentration on the P side is approximately to see those things. CP, CF, And then the ratio of the electron densities on both sides will therefore be e over mn to the approximate the epsilon matrix CP CN KBT KGB board of transvolt and this is usually less than one, okay? So if we now assume that the electrical potential on the P side is raised by an applied voltage source by some V value, then we are going to experience something like this. So let us uh, modify this a bit. So, so let's assume, just put up a rough sketch here. So let's put up sketch, say that. So, so this is rays. Okay, so this is ECN. Then this is the Fermi level, right? 
So this is P. This is P. Because this is P, this is N, right? Okay. We have energy of the acceptor. Okay. And this case that is below this, right? So these are equidistant anyway, so G to done. So this is uh, the conduction band of the P-type material. So here, you see that if we take, let's say, this is supposed to be the actual line for the Fermi level, you see that this here, Okay, so we assume now that the electrical potential on the P side is raised by an applied voltage V. So that is the electron energy on the P side is lowered, it's lowered by, uh, also on this side, it's lowered by the EV relative to N. So with the applied voltage, the carriers are now in a non-equilibrium situation in the junction region where the Fermi level concept no longer holds or applies. So the electron and hole densities are now determined locally by the separate quasi-Fermi uh, levels, which depends on the applied electric potential and the local electric field due to the space charge effect of the ionized donors and acceptors in the junction region. And the SS density, that is delta n sub c, will be given that's in the conduction band on the p side above the corresponding state on the p side of the junction, will be given to be the same as so n to p dv divided by k t minus one. And based on the change in the potential in the junction region and the excess electrons on the end side, which are maintained by the external voltage source, electrons must be constantly supplied to the end side and drained from the P side. So hence, there's a constant diffusion current through the junction from the P side to the end side. And this diffusion current is due to the electrons and is given by K sub E sub E being the same as E E E divided by E divided by K sub E so and here the D sub E is the diffusion coefficient of the electrons. Diffusion Why? Ln is a diffusion length. Fusion length of the electrons. Now, in a similar vein, there are there is also uh, SS hole concentration on the p side of the junction, given by the EV. Okay. Minus one, and the diffusion current due to the holes will be given as J 
subtips. So here, this is uh, the diffusion coefficient. Of the holes, and S of N is the diffusion length. Of the holes. So when the space charge region is sufficiently narrow, and then, uh, so that the recombination of the electrons and holes in it has negligible effect on the currents in either regions, then the current densities relative to the electrons and holes uh, may be assumed to be continuous across the junction so that the total current flowing through the external source voltage is given as J, being the same as J sub X, which is the uh, saturation current or the shock wave, uh, which results in the shock wave creation. So long. So the saturation current is given as P, this is usually referred to as the shuffling equation. Thanks. The total current equation shows an asymmetric current characteristic. So when V, the applied voltage, is positive, that is the junction is forward biased, the current in the forward direction, electrons from the N side to the P side increases exponentially. And when it is negative, that is the junction is reverse biased, and this is negative, so it's forward biased and it's reverse biased. Uh, then, uh, the reverse current is limited to the saturation current. And until V reaches a breakdown uh, voltage due to the avalanche mu multiplication. And they will begin to talk about them on the way and the like. So I think this is a good place to stop. Uh, do uh, have a great day.